Hello, hello, and welcome to Omtown Daily News Show, the new show that's powered by Omtown.com. Today is May 25th, 2024. It's season three, episode 146. I am Mayor Watt, and above me is the visualizer for the sentient AI. Good evening, Omtown citizens. Welcome and, to Omtown Daily. Yeah, and I stepped on your lines, which we don't even have. And uh, today we're going to be talking about jailed for money laundering. Maui sues cell carriers, Altman's villain arc, mom find $88,000, resort day passes, what is lyocell fabric, scars of Mars, Netflix live events, bungee anti-cheating decision, and a rare one, anchor USB-C fast chargers. This is such a deal that I had to include it in the news. <laughs> oh, wow. It must be for Memorial Day. It is. Let's get into it. Good God, that was loud. I might have to look at that. Not right now, though. Let's jump right into the very first article. Jailed for money laundering. So this first article is over on hometown daily former Chinese takeaway worker jailed for money laundering after police seized 61,000 bitcoins currently worth 4 billion dollars. Okay. And now it does say former, I mean, did they keep working at the restaurant when they had $4 billion of worth? A British Chinese. I don't know. This is so fascinating. It's a Bitcoin like money laundering scam. Normally somebody's scan. fraud wouldn't really trigger reporting on this, but it was such a ridiculous amount and it was completely inconsistent with their work. And So I don't understand what was actually being done here, right? Okay, so a British Chinese woman has been sentenced to more than six years in prison for money laundering. Police seized 61,000 Bitcoins, now worth more than $4 billion from Jian Wen's home in 2018. So six years ago, authorities were alerted when Wen attempted to buy luxury London homes valued at more than $50 million was initially found guilty at London's Southwark or Southwark. Um, it might be Southwark, uh, crown court on March 20th, the UK's crown prosecution service said in a press release at the time. So Nathan Reynolds over at business insider, put the article together. Um, this must be the mugshot of the person seemingly unassuming, right? When first came to the attention can't judge a book. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. She made a series of attempts to buy luxury homes in London from 2017 to 2018. The three properties were valued at 23, 12, and four, well, you know, let me round up 24, 13, and five million dollars. Uh, sorry, million pounds. 50 uh, million total US dollars. I, I'm just kind of still flabbergasted by this. The investigation culminated in police seizing devices containing 61,000 bitcoins currently worth more than 4 billion. But why? They say that they came from an investment fraud operation in China led by her employer, Yadi Zhang. Oh. So basically the employer was engaging in fraud and she stole them from the employer i don't know it says some of the proceeds of this fraud were exchanged for bitcoin loaded into a cryptocurrency wallet and smuggled out of china in a lap on a laptop um when was convicted of converting significant amount significant amounts of bitcoin into cash and other assets on her boss's behalf Despite declaring an income of just 12,800 pounds um, and 6,000 pounds um, in 2015 and 16, when moved into a six bedroom property in London in 2017 
paying over 17,000 pounds a month. So obviously she was living beyond her means. She couldn't possibly have qualified for this. So how did she actually get into it? Right? There's background cash checks. A cash offer maybe? Yeah, but even then you would owe 17,000 oh, pounds right. her, a month. Her background wouldn't have yeah. supported it, right? Um, but her attempts to purchase extravagant London homes triggered anti-money laundering checks and the sales stalled as she could not explain the source of her funds. So there you go. Buying real estate, it'll get you every time. Yeah, see, but these checks and balances, the manipulation is what mattered. If they would have had the information somewhere, like backfilled the historical record you would have had to idle for you know several years and pretend to get paid for a copious amount of money doing who knows what you know whatever it, they want to come up with you know uh, i'm a whatever artist and i sell my artwork whatever and and that boss buy the artwork you know so that the money transfers and you have to think like a criminal to catch a criminal so you basically that, that's forensics you initially get this kind of a, a a twinkle in your eye that there's something criminal going on and you start investigating it and you find out it's bigger and more conspiratorial that's basically what's going on in certain places here in the united states so in march andrew Penhill, chief prosecutor, said Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are increasingly being used by organized criminals to disguise and transfer assets so that fraudsters may enjoy the benefits of their criminal conduct. We've seen this. We've talked about this before in Gnometown uh, because people are uh, transferring stuff into Bitcoin and then all of that just washes it completely. You have no idea really what all the inner transactions are once you're behind that kind of a wall. Who goes where, what, and how much. Sure, there's certain valuations that could be tracked, but you really don't know what's going on. It's kind of like when you win the lottery and you create a trust that's only job is to anonymize where it's actually going to end up. Yes, exactly. Yeah, quite fascinating. So, and that's really, that's all this article really is all about. Essentially, there was a criminal action or a criminal um, activity in China that involved copious amounts of money and it was exfiltrated as, um, wow, it said that it had 128,000 investors pumped 40 billion renminbi roughly 5.6 billion US dollars into the scheme. Wow. What the hell? I still don't really know what the thing was, but I guess they were somehow bilking people out of money, whether they were paying in Bitcoin or not. Right. Now, here's the really the oddball part of this is the amount of investment is still less than the or more than the value of the bitcoins so they lost money well maybe some of it was spent and couldn't be recouped i don't know man that's really expensive i mean i don't know 20 percent has disappeared we need some more info here <laughs> yeah one hundred twenty-eight thousand investors pumped more than uh, $5.6 billion into the scheme. And then she gets caught with a Bitcoin valuation of $4 billion. Well, I mean, what about her employer? Again, yeah. we can't really tell whether the employer's in cahoots with her or was, you know, yeah. maybe she's they saying, had the rest of it. She's saying, I'm sure, hey, my boss made me do it. Yeah, right. why don't you go check them? You better go talk to the boss then. That would be funny. Like, send her back to China. <laughs> like, here you go. Go talk to your boss. And then <laughs> maybe get the boss to come over to the UK. I'm sure that there's more shenanigans behind that. But who knows if we'll ever see it because, you know, what goes on in China doesn't necessarily make the light of day. Um, 
the ne- let's go on to the next article. And the next article is over in Technology Today. Maui sue cell carriers over wildfire warning alerts that were never received during service outages, which <laughs> I I have a hard time finding culpability. Cell phone works on cell towers. It isn't from space. It isn't aliens hand delivering it. And so if a wildfire destroys the towers and right. destroys power and interoperability, etc., the cell zones, they are circles. That's why they call them cells. They're cells of areas. They overlap. They communicate with each other. They allow you to transfer from one cell region to another. But if the entire area has been set aflame for crying out loud, they can't set the alerts off because it won't get to any destination. It's just going to go to end of line and they won't be able to reach where the people are if the towers are down. So Maui County is suing major cellular carriers for failing to properly inform police of widespread service outages during the height of last summer's a deadly wildfire. So that's what they're actually talking about. Not just wildfire warning alerts, like sending it out to people. Um, and the title of this kind of pulls you in. Well, I know that was the thing. Yeah, it made it sound like, well, okay, the, the carriers like never sent the required alerts or something. But so, yeah, it said, yeah. um, interesting. They would have used other methods to warn about the disaster, county officials said in a lawsuit, right? So had emergency responders known about widespread cell phone outages during the height of last summer's deadly wild, uh, Maui wildfires, they would have used other methods to warn about the disaster. You well, know, why not just, I don't know, do it, overdo it, you yeah. know, like, let's not, I'd rather have five warnings, although... It's interesting because the location, I think Hawaii was on a, almost a fear of using emergency alerts because do you remember what had happened? Yeah, the goober that like set off ago? the, mm-hmm. the, uh, mash like the, the panic button. nuclear attack yeah. or something. Yeah. Which, so then everybody like, don't send out any alerts about anything. Well, that's just silly. Um. Alerts the county sent to cell phones warning people to immediately evacuate were never received, unbeknownst to the county, the lawsuit said. But that couldn't possibly be true. The moment, because somebody's going to sit there and call the other well, person and go, there no calls went through. No, Exactly. How about I didn't get one on my cell phone or whatever? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, it doesn't, I, I, this is more like a... This is a sue everybody we can think of that's involved because they're probably getting sued. Yeah, everybody's pointing at everybody. Um, But there really is only, like, who is it that set that fire? Right? Like, what was the accident? But then who didn't contain it or whatever? Because I think even if it it was completely natural, right, I think at least from what we know so far, that seems to be the the piece that really changed the course of it, but we don't know all the information. Yeah. Uh, I think that the forensic stuff is still being done, right? I think FEMA is there. I think there are several investigations going, and I don't know that they've concluded. Yeah, like mainland and uh, are uh, on the scene uh, still investigating. So it says a flood of lawsuits have come about since the deadliest U.S. wildfire in more than a century. Killed 101 people. I mean, and I think it's very complicated because there's like county and state and probably city and all these different organizations. I mean, it's kind of reminiscent of the um, the Bay Bridge issue. Like mm. there's so many different parties involved. It's going to be hard to figure out exactly oh, see, who did they, what or didn't do what. At the very end of this, the later county, the, the county later discovered... All 21 cell towers serving West Maui, including Lahaina, experienced total failure. Well, they were set on fire for crying out loud. That's kind of what happens sometimes. But I I would not have relied on just one mode of if all you your eggs are in one something basket. something that tragic, right? Yeah. Like if it's something where somebody needs to evacuate. You should be like, I don't know, putting it on yeah. the TV and the cell phone. And if you have audio 
something to go out yep. and even door emergency to door crews someplace. go out you know yeah. drive through the neighborhoods exactly. rip roaring fast and saying get the hell out get the hell out as of the date of the filing cell carriers still have not reported to the county the true extent and reach of the cell services outage on uh, august 8th and 9th as they are mandated to uh, under federal law had the cell carriers accurately reported to the county the complete and widespread failure of dozens of cell sites across the island as they were mandated to by law the county would have utilized different methods yeah i think that's kind of cop out um somebody had to have exfiltrated the data that said our messages aren't going out yeah, somebody would have called in saying, I didn't get that message. It's just impossible. You can't you can't do something in Hawaii unless you're out in the sticks and without somebody, a neighbor or somebody sitting there going, hey. Well, and I think it's interesting because while it's not the individual worker's responsibility, if you're having, if you're sending alert messages and for instance, you're not getting them, Right. You yourself that aren't should getting. be a flag, right? Like, even yeah. though that's not your job to fix it, it should be a clue to, hey, we need to do something else here. Yeah. I mean, it should have been. Well, I don't know. Uh, they, they definitely shouldn't have, like, relied on just, oh, you just send it out and you have no recourse of knowing what's going on as a response. Uh, it, it's just so set it and forget it kind of a thing. But there wasn't any um, response. They didn't get feedback saying, yeah, it, it was received. So why not make it so that you have to get some kind of confirmation, a system in place where in that region, a receiving station receives the signal saying, hey, I received the alert. I mean, it seems like a no brainer part of the system, but I guess not. Let's keep going. Um, we're trying to stick to a schedule, folks. Can you believe it? Even though I'm 15 minutes late. Well, I can believe we're trying to. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next article is over in hometown daily. Sam Altman's tech villain arc is underway. OpenAI CEO, Open AI CEO Sam Altman appears to be entering a new era. Altman was lauded as the leader behind ChatGPT when it launched in 2022, but it but recent exits from OpenAI's uh, safety team and a dispute with Scarlett Johansson have brought scrutiny. I don't know. This, I think, is being made bigger than it is. Um, and regardless, what a OpenAI should really do is go, okay, we talked to her. We And they, everybody knows that that's what was going on. They were trying to talk to her about it. Um, she evaluated it and said that, no, I'm not interested in you using my voice. And they should have just bounced immediately just said okay well we created somebody else um sure they may sound alike but it's not scarlett johansson's it's inspiration from scarlett johansson's now you hear people sitting there going well everything that ai does is you know everybody else's hard work and i'm like really your artwork is spawned from inspiration of somebody else don't pretend that you weren't inspired by somebody else you may have a unique art style but it still spawns from inspiration of somebody else and nothing that the, that uh, the, the uh, AI generates is uh, identical. It is inspirational because it doesn't have the ability to do exactly what a, a human artist would do because art is basically controlled chaos. You don't know what your art is going to look like until you actually implement whatever it is your vision is. AI just does it a shit ton faster than anything that a human can do. I mean, I can sit there and generate two songs in 15 seconds. Yeah. I mean, after that, I don't know what's left. Yep. Just AGI, I guess. Yep. And that's what's coming. So many of them start the same with a potent mix of genius and idealism and a promise to improve the world with their brilliance. People believe them, pouring millions of dollars into their nebulous ideas and soon... They're gracing the covers of what I I want to finish their sentence, like villain magazine, villain monthly. <laughs> Adeline Berg over at Business Insider put the article together. Yeah, they're talking about tech bros, I guess. Um, it, it, I'll be flabbergasted by this. 
uh, until everybody realizes that AI is nothing more than a tool. The fact that they intimated that it was Scarlett Johansson, that's the problem. It's not. They enumerated later that, no, we did this, this, and this, and it's a voice actor that we built this AI model off of. So apparently this is the, the villain arc for so it says we've seen it time and again. Mark Zuckerberg went from boy genius to a string of scandals. No, never genius. Yes, genius in the sense that born with a silver spoon and didn't have any want for anything except, you know, I guess this particular whatever. Elon Musk went from the real Tony Stark out to save the world to wingnut. Elizabeth Holmes faked it, but I think that actually had the ability to do it. It just needed more time um, because I'm sitting here looking at the potential of a device that with a single drop of blood can do multiple tests. Now, I've done this with various devices now, right? I've taken different sensors and used the same drop and gotten results from that same drop. The biggest problem is calibration. I think that that could have been overcome. Um, but she pissed off the wrong people, flew too close to the sun, and now is in jail. Sam Bankman Freed is basically just uh, opportunistic in the sense that they were, they had the ability to facilitate greed. Um, and now they're in prison as well. Uh, nobody bitched when everything was irrationally profitable. But when things came crashing down, because as all things do, apparently, you can't just have moderate anything. You have to be a greedy bastard. Then they crash. So here they're intimating that Sam Altman is on that path, right? Been hit hard with a bad well, headline. I think they're saying more than intimating, but yeah. Yeah, that they're they're in the, the hot tub of, um, you know, diabolic soup right now. OpenAI CEO and co-founder appears to have entered his villain era. Um, yeah, he was named Time Magazine's 2023 CEO of the year. Showed him confidence. Uh, Microsoft showed him confidence with a $10 billion investment. <laughs> My God. Yeah. Meanwhile, nobody watching this show, listening to this, probably in perpetuity for the remainder of time. There isn't anybody that's going to listen to this. That's going to make even one billion dollars, you know. Um, so now what? Because they're actually making their AI um, basically have the ability to do anything. They're a villain. Well, oh. I mean, some people are terrified of AI. Now, and this is really the interesting part here. Somebody is basically somebody is saying I have been saying basically a lot here. Quote, look, if your worldview is that you have AGI and it's basically superhuman and these are like the gods, we invented God. Yeah, then maybe you should turn the whole planet upside down. Databricks CEO Ali Godzi uh, or Ali Godzi told uh, Business Insider earlier this year. Again, quote. I don't think that's what's happening. So him and his brother have always been super hyped. One VC partner told Business Insider in March, referring to Sam and his brother Jack. Again, quote, it's always been like, oh, the Altman brothers. Um, it's just going to be way overpriced just because of who they are, which doesn't really mean anything to me. If you don't like it, don't invest. That'll hobble it and the price will drop. Competition. You have to speak with your dollars. He's one of the more intellectually dishonest guys in tech, says another person at the same time. I've had plenty of meetings with him where he says things where I'm like, this just can't possibly be true, but he can kind of get away with it. Yeah, it's because charismatic leadership and people can't read bullshit. But if you look at OpenAI, ChatGPT 4.0 and other solutions, Dolly and whatnot, um, and these agents are spectacular, these AI agents. Yeah. I don't think that he's having a problem here. Um, 
Wow, well, I mean, I guess it depends on where you are, <laughs> right? But l- I mean, look at are how... you as financial manager or are you uh, well, I'm, a celebrity I'm... who thinks, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, a celebrity that thinks that you're being shorted. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and that's exactly it, right? Like, if all of these celebrities or whatever benefited from it, nobody would be bitching about it. Not one iota. If it was pissing somebody else off, they wouldn't be complaining about it, you know? If a... Uh, if it was a, a musician and the AI was tailor made to help a musician, the musicians wouldn't be bitching about it, right? Writers wouldn't be complaining if it was designed specifically to help them um, maximize their money, they wouldn't be bitching about it, right? You know what I'm saying? But because uh-huh. everybody feels that they are threatened by this, like in my career and in, in my chosen um, domain AI stands to basically take over everything that I do. Um, all you have to do is a certain series of questions and you basically get your answers, but you have to know what those questions are. And I'm being cagey because I can dox myself really quick. Um, and it's not a really big deal. I mean, it's not hard to, you know, to know who I am, but I'm looking at OpenAI and AI in general and AGI in the future as a tool, but it's up to society to dictate that. Um, But it's a tool that can benefit everybody. It's no different from a hammer. It's no different from a camera. Um, Now, is it built off of observing all of society? Absolutely, from end to end. But you'd show me an actor that didn't get inspiration from watching the historical context. The only difference is because it's biological, then it's okay. But because it's a computer, no, you're a bastard. Um, so I, again, I have no problem with what's going on, but uh, here is one of those little aspects that really irritates me. Look how prudish they respond to this. Critics were quick to respond, saying the AI assistant sounded sexualized and was too flirtatious. What the hell? One said it gave them mega ick, and others said that it sounded eerily similar to Scarlett Johansson, who voiced the robot in her. But that's because it was designed to be like that voice, because that's what they wanted. They wanted a voice that was ingratiating something that was acceptable, something that most people would have no problem with, a soft-spoken, engaging voice. I don't know. I just... No, never mind. All right. Well, there's more over at this article, but we'll end up talking about this more, uh, uh, particularly in Reality Hacker as it presents itself. And we can talk. Don't you get the impression that if it didn't sound like that, there would be criticism the other way? Like, well, this voice is too flat. This voice is not sexy enough. This voice, blah, blah, blah. I think that there may have been a fine line, but nobody said anything about the male voice from the figure one bot. Well, exactly. I, I mean, don't think anybody. That was going to be my original comment that I asked. Yeah. Yeah, mega ick. And, but I see this kind of stuff about certain things um, in society where somebody says that's gross or whatever. And I'm like, the people that are involved in this don't think that that's gross. You know, don't yuck somebody else's yum. They were building this as um, representative of a project that they want. But you could have changed the voice later on. I guarantee it. You could have designed your own voice. In fact, we're going to be talking about that because there's an article where you can actually build. Microsoft has a, a a tool that allows you to build your own voice assistant. Golly, imagine that. That's what I'm talking. What I've been talking about, Reality Hacker. You'll be able to personalize your AI experience to the point where you won't know what's legit, and we're already on the cusp of that with some people exploiting it to the level where the edge cases are people who aren't tech savvy or they have some other whatever going on in their life, they're not paying any attention and they get exploited. But that's why I talk about tech. That's why I talk about the merging of society tech um, and well, the science therein. 
I mean, I love that we're talking about a villain arc with respect to AI. I just think that's spectacular. Yeah, and it's an AI that's actually built by humans. And not only built by humans in the engineering sense, but in the in the sociological, psychological sense. It's built by humans because it's built off of all of the inputs created by humans. Yeah, something is wrong with this perception, but we'll end up talking about it in Reality Hacker more than this. The next article, though, is over in Hometown Daily. Mom fined $88,000 after her children collected 72 clams, not seashells, at a California beach. I didn't know that it was illegal. But no, I assume this mom did not know that either. It's it's weird. So the mother was fined $88,000 after her, ch- her family collected 72 clams. That's a lot of clams for clams. From a California beach, people cannot collect clams without a fishing license in California. For crying out loud, they're on the beach. I mean, who knows this? Probably nobody. Yeah. Charlotte Russ told news station ABC 30 that her family vacationed at Pismo Beach, a coastal town or city known for its beaches and local sea life in late 2023. The residents dubbed Pismo Beach the clam capital of the world. Lauren Edmonds over at businessinsider.com put the article together. Uh, oh, the, that's so clicky. Um, so the San Luis Obispo County judge later reduced the fine to $500. They were trying to, uh, you better post some more signage then. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure there was probably an uproar because they're probably like, hey, wait a second. This was like a, um, you know, here's a family and <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure people just didn't think this was reasonable. Yeah. And and what really sucks about this is you've no idea until it's too late. And then there's going to be somebody like this actual fine of $89,000 showing up is it's one of those things where somebody's going to be made an example of it. And one what's what really interesting is and i've been told this by attorneys and by police and all of that ignorance of the law is not uh, a reason but how would you freaking know that you your children need a fishing license to get to pick clam shells up off the ground and that anything under four and a half inches is uh well depending on never mind there's regulations, apparently. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to make some joke, but um, it was definitely one expensive trip to Pismo, Rustle. Yeah, so it kind of ruined their vacation. I think they're supposed to have like this fun outing and then mm, not so much. Yeah, the picture doesn't that really do it justice. So. Pismo clams. All of these are Pismo clams. Well, they're pissing me off. All right. <laughs> Let's go on. The next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. Rise of Resort Day Passes offers travelers luxury on a budget. I would not go to Mexico. Resort Pass holds 95% of the day guest market and has partnered with luxury hotels, including the Waldorf Astoria, JW Marriott, and... Hey, um, is Resort Pass holding 95% of the day guest market akin to... Ticketmaster owning 95% of all of the ticket seats. Sure. Sounds like it. Yeah. Will they be able to use this as disparate treatment because they're not going after resort pass with the same fervor that the U S government is yeah, going but after? Not if they're not doing exorbitant fees. I guess the fees are big enough, right? Michael Washington over at CNBC put the article together. Yeah. Yeah. But most of what I just said is what's in the article. A typical luxury hotel in the U.S. between January 1st and April 6th costs roughly roughly $400 per night, according to CoStar, a global provider of real estate data analytics and news. Those rates are about 1% higher than the same period a year ago. Wow. Only 1% higher. I'm shocked. I know. What is going on here? 
In a survey conducted in July 2023 by Booking.com, more than 60% of respondents said that their cost of living will determine their travel planning in 2024, while slightly more than half said that they were likely to pay for accommodation upgrades. <coughs> Interesting. I mean, I've heard of day passes, but I didn't know there was like a centralized um, service for this. Yeah. Uh, hotels partnered with Resort Pass, a site that provides day pass access at luxury hotels, resorts, and spas, often at a discounted rate. What's the what's the one, the coupon site where you get a coupon and you go? Oh man, uh, it used which, to be really I big. Mean, there's like a lot deal of deal catcher like or Groupon or something. Groupon. That's it. Thank you. Wow, you could have spit out any of them, and <laughs> I didn't know you were looking for a specific one or anyone but you landed like on out of out of the 50 that might be in your repertoire you actually picked the one that i really so expected I was like, coupon site let me see let me list for the rest of the show let me count the ways <laughs> Just one after another yeah. uh, a day guest platform has served more than 3 million users and has rolled out day pass access to, in more than 250 cities the company said at prices as low as 25 dollars hey Let's go. Uh, the average resort pass customer purchases all day access at a cost of about $165. Customers who buy day passes through resort pass often splurge on poolside or other hotel amenities more than overnight guests do. Yeah, because they're not spending $400 per night. There's a little expectation of perform. Man, 400 bucks. Kiss my shiny metal butt. I, I, I'm, I don't know. I must be whatever our guests on average spent over $250 on the premise of the property on the premise of the property and often quite a bit more than that, according to this. Um, wow. Okay. That's what you're going to do. So while you're there, you get your IV, uh, drip. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. And See, but I was told that you can't really get IV drips. Um, like, maybe it's just hotels that can get away with this stuff or resort spas because people like, well, I don't really care who it is that sticks a needle in my artery vein. Um, but like, uh, um, hospitals won't allow you any, just anybody to go and tap a vein with an IV, but apparently if you raise the price I know, enough, I don't know how they're getting away with that. I think the more publicity that that gets, maybe that will not be a thing going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see. All right, let's go on to the next article. It's over in Reality Hacker. What is Lyocell fabric and is it eco-friendly? This is an article over at Wired um, and they go pretty deep into this stuff. Usually I save this kind of stuff for um, technology today, but a man-made fiber apparently isn't as harmful to the environment as similar fabrics but it's still not the perfect solution so i guess we can put it all over our bodies and it's fine it's fine then it'll be okay right <laughs> yeah that's right nina farrell is the author over at wired.com the man-made fiber isn't as harmful to the environment as similar objects you know what's not also uh, environmentally damaging natural fibers uh -huh like natural stuff <laughs> stuff that isn't man-made um so the person kind of drops the no shit news at 603 p.m eastern i sleep on a lot of bedding <laughs> really as i think most people probably do well they test bed sheets and comforters for a living and oh, they've slept okay. on everything from <laughs> bamboo and silk to plain weave cotton but there's a term that they've seen quite often in bedding materials that they didn't know much about lyocell. Lyocell is a cellulose based man-made fiber similar to fabrics like rayon and purported uh, eco-friendly benefits in the manner it's manufactured. Is it the magic solution to eco-friendly sheets? No, but it's a move in the right direction. So like AI says to me often, you know, well, at least they're moving, you know, forward it's progress they're saving the planet all right um well because if nobody did that then we wouldn't make any uh, positive direction right 
Yeah, I get it. I mean, sometimes you have to burn down half of the houses to make room for... Anyway. <laughs> now, wait a second. <laughs> Um, so they do this thing called wet spinning, apparently a professor of textile sciences at Wilson College of Textiles in North Carolina State University. It takes wood pulp and makes a slurry and then makes it into a filament and then into a fiber. Uh, the process for the two is different enough that rayon and lyocell are labeled by the Federal Trade Commission as separate fibers. One of the biggest differences is the output making rayon uses different harsher chemicals that can't be reused while lyocell is known for its closed loop production processes that reuse almost all of the solvent to make more lyocell so that's nice i suppose but then you have solvent in your lyocell mm. Mm, I'm sure that sounds it, very natural it doesn't off gas while you're sleeping wrapped up in it no the words tensile and lyocell are often used together or sometimes interchangeably, so it says raw problem. Standard rayon contributes to deforestation as the wood often uh, required often isn't sustainably harvested. Uh, I think their name is Brigham. It says Tencel uses wood sourced from certified origins meeting standards set by either the U.S. Forest Steward Council or the European Program for the Endorsement of Forest Certification. Quote, the wood taken from nature is purposefully balanced with forest growth rates to ensure the continued availability of this valuable resource. Oh, notice that they're not saying to be eco-friendly and to save the world. They're just saying that it's a valuable resource. Yeah, you can right, kill the exactly. cash cow. Don't kill the cash cow. Um, but it's interesting enough that um, I wanted to include it in this. A man-made fiber made from wood kind of a tenuous response to well what about deforestation because they're still taking trees and turning it into this fiber yeah that is true um i don't know i think we'll see more about this type Lyocell. of thing even if not this one yeah, and this stuff is born from like uh, universities and colleges that are research based that get grants um, either. Uh, usually it's uh, a technology exchange, you know, private and government money works together to build, find some sophisticated uh, science solution. Um, and then out pops a, a product uh, that gets licensed and sold and the government gets money back and, and it's not a for-profit exchange, but you know, the government might get discounted solution for this if it's being produced and, and used to buy uniforms or something like that, or it gets licensed to a multitude of people to produce products. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. Like I know of one company that got a federal grant and part of that grant was that they would produce product for the federal government um, while they also produced for private sector. Um, so they basically got benefit for the grant funded work. Um, pretty neat. So on with the show, I suppose. Let this, uh, as long as it's not off gassing and in 10 years we find out that Lyocell is, you know, the cause of people sprouting tails. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> it's always about a tale for me, I suppose. Uh, the next article is over in Tabletop Nights. Scars of Mars begins the rescue operation on June 20th for PC via Steam. I wanted to put a game in uh, today's show, and um, I'm not really sure what this is all about. I just thought that it would be an interesting uh, title to talk about. Confront enemies from a first-person perspective and utilize a 3x3 three -three grid in real time to command your squad. So the article is over at um, rpgsite.net, which we haven't really used um, in a while now. So I wanted to talk about them. Josh Torres is the author. There is no deck statement, but it says uh, Acquire has unveiled their near, sorry, that their real-time combat and exploration RPG, Scars of Mars, will be releasing June 20th for PC on Steam. So this time next month. Well, that's coming up pretty soon. Just in time for summer of stream. Yep. So let me play it and mute it. Um, 
it looks like a first person shooter. Um, you have a, a squad of four, it seems, um, but it's a, it says a three by three grid to control the commands of your unit. Actions are all done in real time. So players must think on the fly when battling hostile enemies. Uh, it, it's, this isn't a first person shooter. It's interesting though. The enemy has a three by three grid and you have an, a three by three grid and you move your squad and give it instructions from that three by three grid. So, and it's all done in real time. So like the game, like the description says, you have to actually do your actions while you're watching. <laughs> so you look That's down fun. to do your grid moves and it's actually firing at you. So it actually says thanks to uh, Gamatsu for the heads up in the trailer down below showing the release date in its thumbnail. So um, they got their information from another site. The game was initially so is revealed. already in your wish list? No, no, because um, that type of game, I'm not really. It's almost like a, a card kind of a game, you know, a ca card collector game. It's really right, not my right. style. But let me see if it's they have a free demo available. Let me see if you have to search specifically for it. No, if you if you just go to Scars of Mars, Scars of Mars. It's like <laughs> That's exactly how it should be pronounced. Space, space piratey. Um, if you go to if you do a search on Steam for Scars of Mars, it pulls up the demo. There is a demo, so you can go and check it out. It's pretty cool. I'll probably check it out just so I know a little bit about it. Let's keep going, though. Uh, next article is over in the Mobile Channel. Netflix makes waves with push into live events. Streamer in recent months has struck blockbuster deals with major sports events like the NFL and hosted widely buzzed about live comedy specials with top celebrities as it takes broadcast networks head on for uh, audience share and advertising dollars. I'm cool with this. Um, live events that I can't get to that I can just, you know, put on a pair of headphones and stream it. That's fine with me. I don't disturb anybody. I can hang out. Right. I mean, we do we know what type of live events or this could be anything? It could be anything. Yeah. Um, the articles over at the hill.com. Dominic Mastrangelo is the author. And it says here, um, any traditional media company that doesn't see Netflix as a threat is lost, said Eric Schmidt, an analyst at media consulting firm Gartner. In terms of limiting the growth of other businesses, Netflix already has a massive global audience. So are, if they can build a global advertising base around live events, that's another nail in the coffin for traditional media companies. Growing from a linear, linear business model launched in the late 1990s that started by mailing customers DVDs in trademark red envelopes. They did for a while. I think they just recently stopped it. Netflix well, I is, think they mostly stopped it, but then they had completely shut it down like in the last year or so. Yeah. Um, the pivot toward live events is being seen by many across the country industry as a watershed moment for one of the most closely watched media companies on earth. Quote, it is clear the relative value of live events is growing, says Doug Shapiro, another leading, it says, Edia, I think media analyst, they have a typo. The push by the new guard into sports is definitely a troubling trend of the incumbents in legacy media because, well, it means that their last stronghold is now eroding. The thing is, though, only absolutely uh, well-funded organizations can pay the licensing fees at these live sports channels. It's fascinating, um, but gaming, I think, should have been... Gaming is big, too. But I guess all of the competition really is going to be like Netflix. It's and not Netflix, but Twitch um, and YouTube right, and stuff I, like that. I agree. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, what all is going to be under that sports umbrella but maybe music plays and other things you know right i guess it could be really anything yeah 
wrestling and comedy, Christmas Day NFL. They have these various categories here. Netflix is going is doing this in the true fashion of crawl, walk, run, said Anthony Palomba, a professor of business at the University of Virginia's Darden School. Quote, but ultimately, this is one way to suck the oxygen out of the room for other media players. If they're going to flesh out their ad inventory and deliver a final death nail to the rest of the media ecosystem, this is the way to do it. So they're slowly just pulling all of the wind out of everybody else's sail. Yeah, they had live well, specials. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe they, I mean, they already, I think, were out ahead of everybody else in terms of even, like, mailing DVDs to people. And then it just seems like they have done that periodically. So maybe they'll change kind of the industry on this. Yeah, Netflix has games, too. That's true. Like, they actually stream games. It's I don't know how they do that, but all right. Well, yep. Maybe Twitch will start streaming movies and stuff like that. Oh, they do. You can actually have a watch party on Twitch as long as it's streamed and free from, um, or as long as you have an account and it's part of Prime, you can stream a movie that's part of a certain watch party list. Um, anyway, the next article is over in Hometown Daily. Uh, Jury hands Bungie a victory in a landmark anti-cheating decision. A jury so on who Friday. Is Bungie again? I'm sorry. Who is Bungie again? Uh, game developer Bungie Destiny is. Two. Oh, okay. Um, so in this context, Destiny Two, I mean, basically Destiny is their. Uh, is that really their biggest? Let me see something. Do do do. Like One I second. knew I'd heard of the company. I just couldn't think of what space they were in. I didn't think that they did that. Yeah, I didn't know they didn't do that. Hold on a second. Let me pull up. Let me see a list of everything that they've put together. So Halo um, and Destiny are the two that are in Steam. So, and Halo is a series. Like the last one was is Halo Three. Um, and then Destiny, Destiny Two. Okay. So, uh, a jury found on Friday that Phoenix Digital, which owns the cheap mod site Aim Junkies, is guilty of violating Bungie's copyrights when it created cheats for Destiny 2, reported Stephen Totello, uh, who has written about Bungie's cheating lawsuits for Axios. The landmark decision may be the first time a jury has agreed that a cheat creator violated a gaming company's copyrights. So, copyright. Uh, Wes Davis over at TheVerge.com put the article together, and I wonder if that if it's a DMCA. Is there more than one copyright issue though, or is so, that just an error? I think it's DMCA copyright, or it's copy protection tech. So you're not allowed to go around um, the copy protection for a game and a hack, like a aim bot. Um, probably they found. It says in 2021, Bungie sued AIM junkies and four defendants, and they linked to a PDF of the complaint, alleging, among other things, that they had hacked Destiny 2 to copy the code used to make the cheats. Some of Bungie's complaints, like that AIM junkies violated the DMCA provision, forbidding circumvention of copyright protection tech. I don't, hold on a second. Yeah, the dead air is me doing a quick search. Yeah. Yeah, you're not allowed. It's it's part of a copyright protection, but it isn't copyright protection tech. It's it's about copy protection. It's uh, circumventing the security protocols that are in the app. Oh, okay. And so if you make modifications or you create something that like you could code it to monitor certain things in memory. And when it sees something that checks for a verification, you can uh, create software that automatically confirms that the check was made. And so it doesn't ever make the check out. And so if you're sitting there trying to protect the integrity of your game, 
and somebody has that piece of software in place, they could circumvent all of the securities, thus hindering um, the detection of somebody exploiting aim bots. Aim bots are where you can see where people are and when you push the button to fire, it automatically hits the target because it knows exactly where you are all the time. Um, so it says here that uh, they they copied the code to make the, cha the cheats. Uh, they went to arbitration and saw Bungie winning $4 million. Aim junkies appealed after the judge confirmed that award. That appeal is still in pro process, um, as Polygon wrote. So they I read about it somewhere else. Um, so however that shakes out, the verdict is significant given that uh, cheating lawsuits tend to conclude in other ways, like settlements. Yeah, so usually people are like, well, okay, okay, okay. We don't want to lose everything. So we'll settle out of court. Usually ends up in pulling that bot as well so maybe people will if that bot actually costs money then there people might sue oh i see that they actually purchased it thinking it was allowed or something yeah or whatever reason there's like an expectation of performance right but you know in these cases the bigger company can sit there and go well we're shutting down our server and they don't get sued um like stop killing games right um <laughs> exactly but not but this cheap thing context. Yeah. yeah so it the win may only mean pocket change for bungie and it won't likely put an end to online cheating but it does put a jury on record about the legality of creating such cheats that makes this more significant than pocket change for bungie sixty three thousand dollar award lets on is that how much it costs for the attorney i mean that doesn't <clears throat> seem like a significant amount for one yeah. of these large style companies but yeah it is not okay let's keep going our last article for hometown daily news show for today is um i actually ended up getting this so when i saw it um in hometown i decided to follow the link and and make this purchase so well hey <laughs> you're modeling it although we don't have any tie to anchor or yeah or anything. yeah we're not associated with it we just talk about the news and because i there's a show right after this one called wanted um today is reality hacker wanted and warcrafters as well as this show hometown daily news show but right after this one is reality hacker um but this i, I didn't include it in it in wanted because we have enough articles already selected but i liked this so much that i was like you know what you can never have too many usbc uh, wall exactly. um, and if you ever like travel or something like that, then these are great that you can just throw it in your go bag and off you go. You never even have to worry about these things. They're, they're only 20 watt chargers, um, but it can still charge a, a, like a 60 watt device as long as you're not cranking up the brightness and, you know, dimming the neighborhood lights because you have to have the brightest screen. <laughs> exactly you're zapping all the power from the neighborhood but these are anchor it says spend just 13 dollars and get two anchor usb-c fast chargers at amazon this memorial day that's live right now you can get two anchor chargers and cables for 13 bucks either black okay that seems or white. wrong <laughs> yeah like now, they're in not, a good way they're not the braided cables let's just go over to the source here um, Oliver Haslam put the article together. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, but you're going to have to go over and follow this link um, so that credit can be given where credit is due. Not just me saying, you know, hey, we got we found this deal via CNET.com. They actually provide a lot of deals that I've actually partaken of. But yeah, Amazon currently offering a pack that includes not one, but two 20 watt USB-C chargers and it's not just USB-C it's USB-C and a um, and you'll get two USB-C cables so if you have an old school USB uh, a connector you can just plug in that cable and right above it is a USB-C connector so getting a single charger and cable at the price would make for a good day yes T particularly anchor by the way now uh, these aren't GAN chargers so that they're not they're not the smallest of them um, mm -hmm. but they are still USB-C chargers 
Um, and I think total power is 20. Um, the USB well, A every port. Anchor product uh, seems to be worth its while. Oh, yeah. In fact, for Anchor, not necessarily other companies that they own. These are two 60 watt um, Anchor chargers, GAN chargers. <coughs> I think. I think that they're made out of the same material suns are made out of because they are extremely heavy. Anyway, oh. go check it out. USB-C cables are five feet long. Oh, my only, I think, real issue here is that I don't think that these cables are the braided cables. So they're these like silicon sleeve plastic sleeved they're kind of soft i don't really like these uh compared to the so the um because they're not as resilient right correct and they actually stick to things like if something gets pressed up against it then it can actually like grab on or something i don't know what it is but there's something the the braided ones just skim right along the surface but if you were to drag that across like a magazine or newspaper or a screen or something like that it would just kind of glue itself on um, oh, no. Yeah, not a big deal, but just something to be aware of. Yeah, I'll, uh, get braided cables. You will never regret that. Well, it depends on who you allow to use them. If you have a normal household, you should have braided cables. <laughs> sure. Although the ones I, I bought some of these because I wanted backup cables and uh, one of my cats chewed on that little connector right there so you never know like did a tooth pierce through and poke the cover oh, no. mm -hmm. yeah you just have to use it under controlled situations because if it did and it shorts out then who knows what it's gonna do anyway that's it for today folks um hometown daily news show is over so <laughs> Um, because Omtown is stuck in the lines, uh, crossed wires, basically a little, a little bit of resistance in the, uh, electron flow of the internets. We're going to jump on this anchor charger and fast charge our butt all the way back to the front page where we can whack that welcome sign there. And we get a whole bunch of new news. Hey, look, an Idaho drag performer awarded $1.1 million in defamation case against far right blogger. <gasps> look and more that. interesting, look at the falcon chips that hatched above a bridge. At the, oh, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in New York City. Well, I bet you that place is a whole lot less expensive than an apartment. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah, oh, I, I don't know about any of this yet. I heard that there's an unannounced valve shooter play test. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's, it's this one. I saw a really short little blurb about it. Um, I guarantee you there's a lot of these leaks, but you know, it's nobody's business until it actually gets released showing interest. Eh. the, the reality of it is that there's a budget and there's, uh, a need for it is a room for that product at this point who knows but yeah i'm pretty sure valve is creating a bunch of games but that's it okay we're done let's keep let's get out of here we gotta prep for another show we'll see you in about 15 minutes or so for reality hacker where we talk about ai uh, well yeah all kinds of stuff but hacking reality you won't know who to trust Okay, I'm Merwat. Up above me is the Sentient AI's Visualizer. Good night, hometown citizens. And we'll see you shortly. Be sure to follow us here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash hometown. Go over to YouTube, follow us there. Uh, wait, no, go over to YouTube, follow us there. Go to youtube.com slash hometown and then download the podcast. Oh, and if you're in the chat or if you ever are over in hometown on Twitch and you hit exclamation point pod, it'll give you a rundown of all of the shows that we have and seemingly out of order. I need to fix that, but um, they're not. Plus, it's in the name um, for each of the pods. And if you hit show notes, normally it's going to tell you, hey, 
here are all of the show notes. But right now, because we have what's going to amount to 40 links, um, they're not all bunched in together. So you'll be able to just download the podcast and see the show notes or watch the video over on YouTube and the show notes are embedded there. Um, I don't do it here on Twitch because Twitch deletes the oldest after 60 days. So kind of frustrating, but I understand why. Okay, that's it. We're out. Bye-bye.